so the thing I'm going to do today is to uh, basically uh, give you a very quick and broad overview of brain imaging methods and some of the analysis that uh, we're applying and you know, some of the problems. Uh, so please interrupt me whenever you would like. Uh, it's, it's going to be informal, it's not going to be uh, uh, like very formal. And I probably have too many slides, so at some stage we will be like uh, skipping a, few, a bunch of that, but uh, you know, uh, hopefully, hopefully you learn something and, uh, and, and again, interrupt me. So in the, in the preparation of that course, I actually you know, stole a lot of slides from many people from the, uh, on the web. So I just wanted to give credits now because uh, otherwise, you know, it's going at the end of it, it's probably going to be lost. Uh, so, uh, so all those people are really, uh, you know, I've, I've just uh, uh, taken some of their work to, uh, to present to you today. So uh, I, I just wanted to, to uh, yeah, thank them for that, uh, for the work. So uh, this is the outline. Uh, so I'm going to give you like a very short overview of the uh, acquisition technique. I think uh, brain imaging, you start by acquiring things and, and knowing exactly what you acquire is one of the key aspects. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to be a bit more in details in the MRI physics. Uh, how many of you are physicists here? Not none of them. Okay, none of you. Okay, uh, but uh, I found the MRI, MRI uh, uh, just a beautiful machine. It's just a fantastic machine. I just would like to transmit a little bit of my enthusiasm for that. Uh, and then I'll go a bit more on neuroscience aspect. You know, do we can we average? Can we do some uh, you know population study with brain imaging? What what are the problems and so on? Uh, then I'll go into uh, you know anatomical information, diffusion information, then functional information, and hopefully the bulk of the you know the uh, the, the course today would be on the functional aspect, um, and then maybe some you know hot, you know like a more recent topic uh, like prediction. Can you predict what the subject is you know doing? Can you predict a disease using brain imaging? This sort of thing, like just laying out a couple of ideas on that on that side, but not uh, not going to uh, more details. And the last part, which I may keep depending on uh, you know time, is that uh, is a little bit of a uh, you know it is an important aspect, especially for teaching. Uh, is uh, how do we make sure that uh, our studies uh, in your imaging, in brain imaging, are reproducible? Uh, and that's uh, that's one of the um, and one, that's one problem in in, in uh, you know in science and neuroscience uh, that uh, we have to solve as a community. So let's uh, start quickly. So you've seen probably yesterday, I'm sorry I, I couldn't be here, but uh, you've seen probably the, the level of a uh, uh, you know, uh, microscopic level of the, uh, uh, at the cellular level, maybe uh, you've seen some things at the, uh, the cortical colon level, and uh, the thing I'm going to talk about is more like the microscopic aspect of the brain uh, and this, its organization. So what are the major modalities? And uh, just for a little bit of a historical reason and for teaching purposes, I'm going to talk uh, quickly about uh, X-ray, I mean CT, which is one of the, the first you know, modality where you, get, you know, have a good view of the anatomy of the brain. Uh, I'm going to also give a quick, very, very brief overview. Everything will be a brief overview, so I'm going to stop that, <laughs> to say that it's a brief overview. But, uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, 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 nuclear medicine uh, images, uh, and then uh, MEGAG, and then uh, MRI. Oops. So spatial and temporal ranges. This is a kind of classical slide that you may have seen already if you're interested in the uh, problem. But uh, all those new imaging techniques have their uh, spatial and temporal uh, resolution somehow. Uh, so uh, if you look at, uh, let, for instance, uh, fMRI, uh, fMRI is a resolution around the, uh, the second, uh, let's say. I mean, uh, it, the actual physiological resolution may be a bit more than that. but. Uh, 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 you know, depending what exactly what you call resolution, temporal resolution, it, it may change. But uh, but basically, it's or the other or the second. Uh, uh, it's a vascular sort of a in modality. Um, a PET has, is more like a probably a, the order of like a several seconds a minute. Uh, 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 EEG, on the contrary, has a, you know the resolution of a, a, you know a milliseconds. I mean, you, uh, that's the the rate at which you acquire data. Uh, and the spatial resolution, I mean, like uh, you, you have this, this other axis, you know, how well can you see, you know, the, uh, the spatial aspect of, of the brain. Uh, and, and MRI can go very, very, uh, you know, low in that. And like if you look at an you know, anatomical MRI, you can go from uh, like uh, several hundred microns. Uh, uh, and, you know, almost like the, you know, some, sometimes you, if, if you have a very high field and, you know, uh, and, you know, animal study, you can go very, very, very precisely on the uh, anatomy of the brain. Uh, 
but obviously, uh, you know, you uh, you know, to have that. I mean, having both the spatial and the temporal resolution is is still a challenge in in your imaging. And if you increase those things, you increase the amount of data and the, the potential problem that you have dealing with the analytics of the data. All right, so that's kind of a quick overview of you know, like saying, you know, like if you think about the modality in brain imaging, think about you know what are the uh, the actual new science that you're looking at. What are the temporal resolution? What's the, what, 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 what's the spatial resolution? Those, those three things really should be uh, in your mind when you're looking at a, a modality. So anatomical versus functional. Um, and then this is like a very precise, you know, anatomy of the brain of uh, Omer. Uh, and, you know, but what is really going on in Omer's brain? Uh, you know, once you've got, let's say, the, the, the structure being, you know the, you know, the cables and so on, let's say you've got the, you know, the CPU and the, uh, and, the, and, and, you know, and the bus and all those things, uh, you know, what, what is the information being, being, being transmitted? What is the, uh, uh, so th those, are basically the, you know, both modalities and both, uh, you know, go hand in hand. Uh, and you, if you want to do a good study, you really have to think of the uh, both at the same time. But those modalities uh, are morally, you know, more or less, you know, sort of a, a dedicated to one aspect. Like uh, if you look at X-ray, for instance, obviously, or CT, this is an anatomical uh, modality. Uh, ultrasound, nuclear medicine is more like a functional modality. You, you've been uh, looking at the, uh, um, you know, neurotransmission aspect. MEG EG is only a functional modality. You've got very, very little information of the structure. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and one of the beauty of uh, MRI is that it really has the potential to do both. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why it's uh, such a major modality in, in brain imaging. So how does a CT work? Well, it's, uh, you've got an X-ray source. You, go, you, know, you look at the source. You, you turn around the object. And uh, it's a tomographic uh, modality. Basically, you're looking at slice by slice. Thomas in Greek slides, uh, and the um, and, and you reconstruct the information having like the projection of the uh, you know all the objects around you. Know, so when you turn, you do get all the projection, and you get the radon transform, and you can reconstruct the inside of the what you you know you're you're seeing uh, through the uh, through the for the projection, and that really and the major aspect I would like to emphasize is that. You know that it was actually possible and make, makes the thing uh, you know real and, and you know usable is the actual FFT is the, the fast Fourier transform that was a major you know, sort of key element in you know these uh, modalities to to be useful and and, uh, and uh, so the development in you know like algorithm and uh, and applied mathematics uh, uh, really has a, you know, like a key uh, you know. Uh, is is do, you know is one one of the things that will load uh, those you know uh, modality to flourish and to uh, to be very useful. So that's a brain CT. I mean uh, nothing very specific about that. Nuclear medicine. It's almost the same principle, uh, except that instead of having the source of the radiation being uh, outside of the object or outside of the you know the uh, uh, the brain or the you know, you know the, um, the what you want to image. It's inside. You inject, uh, in, in, you know, for instance, in the case of a SPECT or PECT, you in inject a radio ligand, uh, which is going to emit some uh, rad uh, you know, uh, radiation. And you, what you're detecting is around this, uh, and you know, you're detecting around the object the radiation. And that's almost the same thing. Then you, know, you also have the tomographic you know, slide by slice, and you also have the, uh, the aspect that you have to reconstruct what is inside the object, having only the information from the outside. Uh, so again, you're going to use FFT, radon transform, and the, those you know, applied mathematic tools. And that's what uh, you know a PET uh, scanner looks like. Um, it's uh, I think it is uh, you know when the, uh, uh, when Total Recall was uh, was filmed. I mean, there's the the the, the machine for the you know the, for Total Recall is very much like a, a PET machine. <laughs> it was it was the there was the new machine at that time, and there was uh, you know this is the uh, the sort of things. Uh, uh, and this is actually Bill Jagers from Berkeley. Uh, so PET, uh, as I said, is basically you have a, a, a bunch of detectors outside of the brain. You've got a radio ligand, and you, you're measuring the, uh, you know, went with basically the, the radio ligand is a positron uh, uh, emit, emitting a radio ligand. And uh, when the positron meets an electron in the, in, uh, you know, in the matter, they, they sort of uh, emit two photons at 512 kilo uh, electrovolts. And, uh, and those, that's the detection that you have. You have you're looking at all the detection of those photons, you know, and, and because you, you know that when there's a lot of uh, activity there, 
uh, then you are able, by looking at all the detection around the brain, you, look in, you can reconstruct where it comes from. That's the, that's the principle. And what is useful, mostly it's oncology. It's very, very important for oncology because the, the tumor, it's, uh, you know, uh, they have a, a higher activity and uh, that, that's a very useful uh, modality for that. Um, it's potentially for, you know, diagnostic, uh, you know, for the spatial distribution for drugs or like, uh, you know, pharmas are using a PET quite a lot because they, they want to know what, where is the drug uh, having an effect in the, uh, in the um, you know, in the brain, for instance. Uh, cognition, it's also a useful thing for, uh, let's say you have a, an endogenous um, uh, a neurotransmitter, for instance, uh, uh, you know, you've got uh, dopamine, you know, you've got the distribution of dopamine in the brain. And, uh, you know, and you, you may have a ligand that is actually displacing dopamine, it's just replacing dopamine. Uh, so you, you may be able to actually look at, you know, how much neurotransmission is going on by how much of displacement is occurring, uh, you know, using PET. So it's a very, it's, it's actually the technique to look at uh, neurotransmission, which is not something which is easy to study, you know, uh, in, in vivo, in the human subject. Uh, so that's, a, that's a ex extremely useful uh, for that. And, uh, you know, constructors are actually doing now PET and CT machines. They have uh, like uh, two modalities in the same machine, and uh, it's very useful for co-registration and for just, uh, you know, the economical quick aspect of uh, having only one one machine doing both uh, things at the same time. So let's turn to uh, EEG MEG uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, so this is. is what is sort of a, uh, uh, because the PET requires more. Exp so, so more more hospitals have fMRI or have MR than PET, right? So it's, yes. So I just do you have an idea about the, like the number of scans done in different modalities. Uh, or like the ratio, I mean. So what is it's, more? It's, dif it's difficult because uh, uh, MRI is used both for clinical and, and uh, co I mean, I'm more like a study um, on, on the side of research and cognitive neuroscience aspect of, uh, of that. But uh, for uh, there is clearly MRI is a much more ubiquitous machine. It's much. I mean, like there are millions of scans being done every you know year. Um, I hope I'm not uh, saying a silly number, but I think it's it's very you know it's a very very high number anyway. Uh, and PET is more uh, it's more expensive. It requires some chemistry. It requires that you have you you are you able to label a, a ligand. You are able to and then to you know and uh, also it has some effects obviously. Many of you it's very controlled for the uh, for like a studying condition because it has some a little bit of radiation. Like um, you know many of the tools that we're using have a little bit of radiation. It's a matter of whether there are you know, nocive radiation enough. I mean you know so it's a uh, uh, but uh, so it's it's uh, it's a much less you know, a uh, spread machine uh, because of the, those, those things. Um, but in, in oncology, it's very, very much used. Uh, SPECT and, and PET are both very much used in oncology. Uh, yeah. Um, the PET scanners tend to be um, located in hospitals where they do a lot of oncology. So for patients who, and it's usually often used after the initial diagnosis. People don't use it to make initial diagnosis, it's yeah. usually used to look for metastases and other yeah. things. So um, the fact that it's more restricted probably isn't that yeah. serious yeah. in and terms the, of its widespread medical and, application. And the, the, main, the main ligand for that is FDG, like you're looking at how much consumption of glucose uh, using uh, fluor. Uh, fluor yeah. So uh, EGMEG. Uh, that's uh, uh, very widespread. I mean, EG is extremely widespread. It's, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the clinical aspect of that is epilepsy mostly, but uh, also other things. Um, and that's, uh, but um, the, the research kind of tool is more, uh, I mean, both are used for research, but uh, the MEG is more like the, uh, the uh, uh, interesting machine. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's beautiful. I mean, you, you've, got, it's, uh, you've got a very elegant uh, you know, hat on the, on the head. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's it basically measuring the uh, elect the, um, the little current that your uh, you know your uh, your brain is is uh, you know the electric the uh, the electric current that uh, the neurons are are, are doing. So um, let me uh, just have a quick uh, uh, recall of that. So the the spikes are not really the thing that we can measure with EEG or MEG. Uh, 
so, so sorry, EEG uh, is the measure of the electric current, uh, while the, uh, uh, the MEG is the measure of the magnetic aspect of the current. So you know that each time you have a little current, you have a little mag uh, you know, a magnetic field around the current, right? So EEG is measuring the, the actual electrical aspect, and MEG is measuring the magnetic aspect. And, the, uh, and, and it's not really the presynaptic uh, spike that is measured, it's, it's the, actually the postsynaptics, which is, uh, you know, uh, has a longer uh, time frame, so you know, about ten, tenths of uh, milliseconds. And that's where, you know, there's enough of, of, of that can, can, can be accumulated and, 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 uh, and uh, average across, you know, enough uh, dendrites such that you can measure something. Because it's obviously it's a, such a very little signal that you're trying to measure. Uh, so this is uh, so EEG and MEG kind of recording. So the uh, the postsynaptic currents that uh, we're looking at. It's EEG is a very you know uh, old you know technique, uh, uh, 1930. Uh, MEG, I'm not exactly sure. Last slide. Do you want the previous slide? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's 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 both. I mean, it's the the, the current uh, and the potential. It's a uh, so, like, so that figure so, is about potential. That, yeah. Okay. But but uh, you know you're measuring the potential of the current and you're measuring the uh, the magnetic aspect of, of that current. So you, it's the uh, in MEG with MEG you're yeah. measuring the, the magnetic yeah. aspect of that current. And so the, the, the temporal resolution is excellent. I mean you're, you know, and you're measuring that you know like uh, you know every millisecond or also. Um, and it's a, it's a much more difficult thing to measure the, um, the magnetic aspect. You've got squids, which are you know like a, in a, a superconducting helium, and you know it's a, it's a much more uh, difficult physical uh, uh, problem. But uh, but also it, it gives you a little bit more of a, a spatial resolution. You know, the the spreading of the of the of the uh, potential is, is 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 much more like with the skull and the skin and all the you know those things. The the, the currents are kind of a, you know what you're measuring is the is, is very much spread. While in MEG you've got a, be a better sort of a localization aspect. Uh, so and you know and I've just put that slide because it's a, you know it's a it's a classic representation. So you look at the and all those slides are from uh, Alex Ranfort from uh, you know Paris that was uh, very kind. Uh, can you give me that go, give me that those slides? So the the uh, the representation is basically that you've got at the end of the day you've got a big matrix uh, which has uh, in one direction the temporal aspect in the other direction the spatial aspect. So here, for instance, uh, you've got one column here is uh, the number of captors that you have, you know, either in EEG or MEG, uh, and one line would be like uh, for one of these captor, what's the uh, temporal sort of a, you know, uh, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the analysis methods are actually going to, you know, look at that matrix and, and try to tease apart what, what are the sources, what, when, you know, how do you summarize this information, how do you, and, and so on. So it's a, it's a useful kind of mental representation that you've got, you know, temporal, spatial, and that's going to be the same for fMRI, for instance. And the, uh, the, the, I mean, it could be temporal, it could be also subjects, like, you know, you could stack subjects uh, information if you want to do a group study or something like that. Um, I've got to watch the time because I, I don't know. Okay. Right. Um, so what can you do with um, EEG, MEG, so cognitive studies, like uh, looking at especially a temporal aspect of, uh, you know, your, your cognition, uh, uh, diagnosis for epilepsy, that's uh, one, one of the big things. Uh, brain computer interface, you may have heard those, you know, applications that, you know, you're uh, you know, trying to from, uh, you know, the, uh, the current, in, I mean, usually EEG, of course, uh, but, uh, you know, how can you, uh, from that, a command, uh, a computer or an apparatus, uh, just you know, without uh, with your uh, with the you know the, the mental activity that you're generating, and that can be very useful for you know handicaps and things like that. And the the g name of the game in EEG MEG is actually you are measuring uh, on the surface, like with uh, electrodes or squids, um, the electrical or the magnetic act activity. Uh, how do you know where this electric or magnetic activity comes from? Where where, where is the actual electrical source that is you know, generating that, that, that signal that you're measuring. And that's a very compli complex problem because it's an eight-post problem. You've got many more possibilities of, of sources 
uh, than you, know, you can accept many, many, an infinite number of possibility of sources, localization, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, a given one uh, you know, measurement on the, on, on the head. So you have to impose some constraints, and there are you know, clever algorithms to sort of uh, uh, try to find where are the sources uh, and their, you know, their, their temporal sort of uh, activity. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's one big sort of uh, analytic um, uh, problem that uh, the MEGAG um, community is, is facing. So let me turn to MRI, uh, which is um, my favorite, uh, the, the, the modality I'm working more of, um, mostly with. Um, and I just, uh, I mean, the, the first slide is basically that uh, MRI, contrary to the other modalities, is not basically one, it's one machine, but it's many modalities. And that's the, that's the, the strength of it, really, is that you, you're, you're able with the same machine, depending on how you program it, uh, to look at very vari variety of, of uh, um, you know, neuroscience uh, um, aspects of the brain, uh, and that's uh, and that's the the key aspect of the MRI, and that's why it's so useful and and, and, it's, and such a beautiful machine. So we, here I'm I'm going to talk about uh, a bit about diffusion, uh, you know, anatomical information and functional information. Uh, just to end up with uh, a EEG and MRI, you can actually try to record both EEG inside the magnet, inside an MRI, and I just wanted to put that slide because uh, you know, this, it's a big deal as well to try to have both the spatial information and the temporal information. And if MRI is give, giving you better spatial information, EEG is giving you better temporal information, can you get both at the same time by measuring you know, conjointly in the same subject at the same time, simultaneously? So those, those are, are interesting studies and, and, and pose a lot of a, you know, physical, good physical challenges because in terms of recording, you know, very, very tiny, uh, you know, potential in a very, you know, huge magnet, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, interesting problems. One thing I want to mention, which is not really an imaging modality, but it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, important and interesting modality, and it's linked somehow to MEG. It's kind of the opposite of MEG. MEG, you're just recording the magnetic field. Uh, TMS, which is a transmagnetic uh, stimulation, is actually you have a little uh, magnetic magnet, that, and you, you, uh, you know, have, you're injecting some uh, current, uh, uh, changing current, and def therefore you, you're generating a changing magnetic field, and this magnetic field is actually going to induce some currents in your neurons. If you, so, so this, you know, this coil is going to, you can stimulate a part of the brain using a, a TMS. And that uh, is mostly used uh, for, um, you know, sort of a shutting down a region temporarily somehow. You know, you're disturbing the, uh, the, uh, the activity of the, of the, of the of yeah, a specific so region. Oh, you showed a video of that, yeah, excellent. Also, like, Okay, so I'm sorry I missed that, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it should, I mean, in terms of ethics, it really it should be considered as a, a, a medicine somehow. You are actually impacting, you know, the, the brain, at, and that's, a, that's a, you know, it's, it's not a recording, you know, thing. It's a, it's a, you are actually, you know, inducing something, so it has to be very carefully uh, monitored. All right, so uh, MRI physics, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer on that. Um, again, it's going to be very rough, and, uh, but hopefully you'll get basic ideas and some maybe enough to sort of go back to you know, the web and, and look at you know, uh, uh, some things that uh, if you are interested. So what's a, what's a scanner? What's an MRI scanner? An MRI scanner is first of all a huge big magnet, like a, you know, like a you know, free Tesla machine uh, is uh, like a, the, the magnetic earth uh, is about 10 to minus 5 Tesla. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 more than the, the magnetic. Earth. So it's a huge magnet. Anything ferromagnetic that you put there is going to fly. It's going to be very dangerous because it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, and that's, uh, that's, uh. and then it's got more magnets somehow. Uh, so that you, this big magnet, you can change the field, uh, you know, depending on the localization. That's, we, we call that the gradient. And it got coils that can, you know, uh, induce radio frequencies. So the, uh, you know, if you change, you know, quickly the, uh, you can induce with magnets to radio frequencies. So all those things are, you know, within the same sort of big machine, um, and the and it's got uh, and this this uh, this this coil here is just like a receiving the uh, magnetic the, the changing magnetic field, uh, you know, around the head. So that's uh, that's what is in one word, in three words, like a, a, an MRI machine. And uh, and to get a big magnet, to get a you know, very high field. 
uh, you need uh, cryogeny, you, you, need, you need to have a, uh, you know, superconducting uh, currents, and so you, get, you, you need to have all this, uh, you know. Uh, so magnet is always on. The, way, you know, the flow, it has a non-resisting, you know, current going to the, uh, the, the magnet, and it's always on, so you have to be, you know, be careful. <laughs> you, know, you never shut down <laughs> the MRI, it's, uh, you know, unless there's a problem, and it's called a quench, and, uh, and you have to better. So what's the principle uh, of that, uh, of the acquisition? And it's not an easy, I mean, you know, I could tell you the principle of CT, basically, you know, a couple of words. You, 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 you have a, you know, radiation, and you look at the, how much the radiation is attenuated for the object, and you know, that, and that's it. And, and you, you know, it's not like a, a complex, you know, thing to understand. MRI is a bit, you know, requires a bit more like, a, you know, physics and, and is more uh, involved in terms of, and that's what, you know, it's, it's kind of fascinating. So MRI will look at, uh, you know, if each of you, let's say, take you the water molecule that you have, you know, uh, maybe uh, you know, there's a lot of water in, in, you know, in all our body and the brain as well. Um, and the, the, the atom of the, the hydrogen atom has a, has a proton that is actually acting a little, little bit of a spin as a, as a magnetic spin. So basically, the, uh, those things are, uh, have some magnetic aspect and they turn around themselves. And so, and all those, you know, uh, those uh, atoms and, and you know, the, the, the nuclei of those atoms, uh, they, they act a little bit like small magnetic spin, right? And that's the, that's the principle of it. So you have, you have to go very deep into physics to sort of uh, you know, know the origin of the signal. And so if you put those things, if you put a head or like a, an object in the, in the magnet, they, you know, those, those little magnets are going to align with the big you know, B0 field, right? So they're going to go all in the same direction, but they're not only going to go in the same direction, they lack, as I said, they lack spin, and therefore they, if you take a spin on, the, in the, sort of the, uh, the, the, on, on Earth, if you spin it, you'll see that the axis of the spin is going to have a precision um, uh, movement, right? And those, those you know, prot uh, protons are actually doing the same thing. They, they act, you know, within this, this, this big field, they act like small things and they have a precession movement. So that's the, that's the origin of the, of the signal. So it's a, it's a bit very deep, like in the, you know, uh, the, 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 the physical, the, the matter, right? The physical matter. And so it's interesting. So if you now put a radio frequency at the same frequency of, the, of, the, uh, of, of this precession movement, then you can, you're going to align all those spin and then you're going to align all those little magnets somehow. And, uh, and, so, and that, if you do that at the, at, the, at the frequency of the precession, you're going to give more and more energy and you have the resonance effect. So all those things are going to align and they're going to synchronize with the radio frequency and, uh, and you're going to do that and, uh, you know, and then, you know, you got a lot of energy, and then you stop, and then you listen. How, do, how does that go back? And so you, what you're looking at is just, you know, the uh, you know, after resonance effect, you know, how the relaxation aspect of the, of the and this relaxation aspect will have different uh, tempo and uh, values and, you know, and uh, um, characteristic depending on whether you're in the gray matter, whether you're in the CSF, when you, you know, so it depends on the, you know, what you're looking at. So I don't know if you, you, know, you could get that, but I think that's the principle. And, and it's a beautiful sort of a, like a very deep into the matter sort of a, a thing. So, so you've got a very you know, technological apparatus that look at very deep physical thing, and it's, it's, it's uh, interesting. Um, so to summarize this, what I've said, you know, if you look at there's just the uh, average uh, you know, magnetic field that is, uh, you know, sort of that the thing that you are interested, you, you're going to, uh, you know, uh, do the impression, so do the radio frequency, get the resonance effect, and then you're going to look at how this resonance effect is going to uh, sort of uh, grow back, you know, towards the B0 value and decrease towards the transverse plane. So, so if I do this, this is just one, my one, some summary of the, of the magnetic, um, you know, uh, moment that I, I'm looking at. And so I'm just going, putting some energy with the radio frequency, okay, I've got the resonance effect, and then I'm listening, it's going back. So it's going back two ways. It's growing up again along the B0, and it's growing down along the, you know, the, uh, the transverse axis, right? So that's the, what this uh, little thing is telling you. And if you just 
take the rotating some sort of a you know coordinate system, you can look at it as you know going down to the transverse plane and then going up again. And what the the T1 and T2 uh, sort of um, uh, um, things are, you know, when you're saying you know you look in an MRI and, and you, the guy will tell you this is a T1 MRI or this is a T2 MRI, um, weighted MRI, and those those are the the time constant by which you know, they grow up again. So T1 is the time constant by which how, I mean, you know, how the, the thing is growing up towards the B0 value, and T2 is the time constant how it goes down on the transverse aspect. So those are the two time constants. I'm going to skip that. So this is just you know, the curves, like you look at the, the T1, how the T1 is growing up again, and the, this growing up again is different depending on where you are in the brain. And the uh, going down, you know, uh, you know, along the transverse plane is, you know, is, has different time constant depending on where you are as well. So this is the, uh, the T1 versus T2 weighted MRI. So, so this is how you distinguish matter in, you know, by looking at the time constant of, you know, uh, uh, relaxation aspect of the, of the, of the, uh, of the magnetic uh, information. And the interesting thing is that the biology is going to kick in there. Uh, if you have more oxygenated uh, blood flow somewhere, you know, it's, it turns out that the oxyhemoglobin is actually diamagnetic and the, uh, the deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic. And so basically, the, the local magnetic field of the oxy and the deoxyhemoglobin uh, are different. And, and therefore, you're going to be able to measure something which is related to how much oxy or deoxyhemoglobin you have in the brain. Uh, and that's, that's where the biology starts to sort of uh, mix up with the, uh, like the, uh, the physics aspect. And, uh, and that's, the, uh, you know, that's why uh, MRI is so you know, like a versatile, because you, know, you, can, you can look at the, those things. Uh, yeah, so the, the oxyhemoglobin have a, like a less disturbing effect on the, on the magnetic field than, the, than deoxyhemoglobin. So all the thing I, I told you, I, I told you we, we're looking at the amount of uh, like a magnetization that we are is coming back and so on. But where does this magnetization come from? I mean, I've told you there's 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 an antenna that we call to you know, measure that thing that is coming, you know, this relaxation effect. But you know, how do I localize thing? How do I know that you know this is the T1 in that space, in a uh, you know, particular place in the brain versus you know the, this one? I mean, I haven't told you anything about that. For the moment, you just have one object that gives one sort of a signal, right? So that's, again, magic. <laughs> the precision movement that I was talking, the, the actual uh, uh, you know, uh, frequency of the precision is depending on the B0. So, so if you have a high field, it's going to process very quickly. If you have a, low, a low, lower field, it's going to process lo you know, slower, right? And that's the uh, uh, Larmor. Frequency. That's the, uh, the, 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 uh, the discovery of uh, Joseph Larmor in the uh, late 19th century. And, um, and so what, what we're going to do in the magnet is uh, put some gradients such that we're going to have a, a slightly more, a higher field in one, hand, one end of the brain and then, and then decreasing, you know, like a, a lower field in the other end of the brain. And then we're going to listen to this whole thing and we are going to know that the higher frequencies are going to be on the left of the brain and the lower frequencies are going to be on the right of the brain. So the principle of the localization is really like, uh, you know, you're changing the frequency and you're looking at, you know, you're just measuring the whole thing and then you're teasing apart what is higher frequency and therefore where it is in, in the, it's like a piano. If you have a you know, high note and you know it's on the right of the piano, if you have a low note, it's, you know it's on the left of the piano. And if you have several on the, at the same time, you can do, again, Fourier analysis and looking at you know, how much you know, the, the low note had and how much the, the high note had. So I'm not going to the details because that gives you the localization aspect on one axis. We have another axis, which is uh, the x. You know, you see, uh, let's say this is x, then you have the, another axis, which is y. So you have to do gradients on the other axis as well. So you have like a, a, and so on, and there's a lot of tricks, and it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating um, area. And then, and then the other thing is the, how do you know in the z direction? Well, in the z direction, you can actually do the same trick, but at the excitation level. So if you have a, a gradient in the z direction, you know you're going to excite 
only one spe specific frequency depending on the z direction if you, you know, change the z direction frequencies uh, ma uh, in the magnetic field. So just to summarize this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking too much time for that <laughs> because I find, I find it fascinating. But uh, just to summarize, the way you localize things in, uh, is uh, actually by uh, you know, looking at the varying the, uh, the, the gradient, the, the, the magnetic field uh, with, the, with space. Uh, and that's just an illustration of uh, what I said. You know, you've got you know, high frequencies on, on the right of the brain, low frequencies on the left of the brain, and you're measuring that, and then you, you're taking the Fourier transform, and that's it. Uh, and that's actually the, the actual recording that you get from you know, a slice in an MRI, and you're taking the inverse Fourier transform. That's the, what you're looking at is the, the actual the, the frequency magnitude. Uh, for, you know, uh, so this, these are the, the low frequencies, or like the... The, uh, the, the, the kind of the shape of the brain, things like that, and you know, on, on you know, the, on the outside, you've got the high frequencies, which are going to give you the, the details, um, and you're taking a Fourier transform. It just uh, so yes, again, you've got like the, uh, the uh, those those tools that are you know going to be super useful for the. Um, so I'm going to keep that, but basically, you know, using those tools and. Uh, all those things, you can look at the anatomy of the brain, gray white matter and uh, you know, skull and all those things, and that's the T1 weighted. Uh, you, you can look at something, I mean, we're going to fun functional MRI, we're, we're going to use that uh, uh, T2 weighted images. Uh, and I'm not you know, going to why, but basically that's, uh, that's another, T2 weighted could be very well an anatomical images as well, right? It's just, it doesn't, uh, but for functional MRI, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the, the one we're going to use. Just want to show you, this is the B0 map. So what, what is the magnetic field uh, when you've put uh, a head on the, in, in, the, in the scanner? And because of the interface with the air and the tissue and all those things, you're disturbing the magnetic field of the scanner, which has to be very, very homogeneous to be a good, you know, a good MRI machine for recording uh, you know, the, the images. And, uh, and one of the problems there, that there is is that, in, especially with fMRI, um, you, because of this disturbance, you've got distortions or loss of signals, and there's a lot of artifacts. Um, one thing that you have to always to <laughs> recall is that uh, you know, anything that is ferromagnetic in the brain is a problem uh, and can be very dangerous for the, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, so this uh, <laughs> specific uh, uh, brain, you, you shouldn't put in the scanner. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, there are accidents. Um, yeah. uh, so many contrasts. So I was telling you, you can look at you know, uh, anatomy, function, uh, blood velocity, uh, blood flow, uh, diffusion, which I'm, I'm going to go into in a, in a moment, uh, and, and, and more in the future. I mean, you know, like biologists working with physicists in, the, in this area, uh, are actually discovering and, and you know, uh, developing new contrasts to look at new things and, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a beautiful mix of biology and physics. Uh, that is, uh, and again, the machine itself, if you think of it, is, is actually more amazing than the space shuttle, I think. I mean, it's a, uh, okay. So that, this is just to show you the, uh, like a, you know, this is a, you know, an anatomical MRI and this is the, the fMRI that we're going to look at and you see uh, you know, the loss of signals like uh, uh, close to the, uh, um, the, uh, the air uh, tissue interfaces. So let's uh, switch gear and uh, let's say that we have a machine to look at the anatomy of the brain. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, how do we uh, do uh, studies across uh, population? How do I take you know, this classroom and then you know, measure something on the functional aspect or the anatomical aspect of your brain and then have a, like a, a, you know, a you know, an, ex uh, an information on the population that, that is uh, the sampling of the population that you are. And the, 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 the community has uh, uh, soon, I mean soonish, uh, converged towards uh, the idea that uh, we should have an atlas of the brain. Uh, and, um, and one of the, the first atlas uh, the, was actually uh, developed by a, 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 a French neurosurgeon who actually needed to go and you know, localize the, the deep structure, the, the thalami, the, uh, the caudate, those deep structure in the, in, in the anatomy of the brain. So he, he thought, okay, I'm going to sort of a, you know, uh, have an XYZ coordinate system. I'm going to put the anterior commissure and the po posterior commissure at those places. I'm going to have like a, all the brains aligned with the same orientation with respect to those little structure. I'm going to have the box 
of those brands like uh, you know, uh, in, in the same box. He, he had a little bit more complex uh, you know, way of doing that, but you know, basically that's the... Uh, the, the uh, and then if I, if I am at the x equal 2 and z equal 3 and uh, y equal minus 5, I know in which structure I'm going to be roughly. And that's the roughly which is... It works quite well for the internal structure. But uh, as soon as you go into the cortex, uh, that's a, a little bit of another matter, and we're going to describe that. So that's the name of the game of what we call spatial normalization, or like a, a, you know, a, some, and the, the uh, imaging I mean, like the uh, image processing community is calling that uh, co-registration or registration sometimes. And so basically, you're taking one anatomy of a brain, and then you're deforming to look like a template brain. And that's, you know, that's the, the principle. So, so there's a, there was a lot of development of uh, standard templates, like the, uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute has uh, the most famous template of the brain that is, uh, uh, you know. Uh, and templates can be in several modalities. You can have template of brain using, you know, T1, T2 star, uh, you know, PET, PET machine have, you know, have a template of a brain and so on. The idea is that you take all your subjects and you deform their uh, specific image to look like the template. And it's a good idea possibly to use several of those modalities to do that, this, in, this, uh, this transform. And there's a lot of problems. And there's the technical problems, which is basically how much do, you, do I morph? I mean, what, how much diffeomorphic you know, uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, variation? I mean, how much, how much degrees of freedom do I put in this transformation? I mean, if I do a linear transformation, I, okay, that's fine. I've got like maybe six degrees of freedom, maybe plus uh, plus three or plus uh, you know six, depending on if you want to shear or you know. But if if I do a, you know a, a, a morphing like a you know like a you know if I I can morph anything to anything if I have enough degrees of freedom. So how much of that do I do? Uh, and um, and sometimes the you know like uh, you you see some deformation that are not biologically plausible because of this problem. And sometimes the patients or the subject I mean, the, the the brain that I'm trying to morph is actually missing piece compared to the template, and that's another problem, and so on. Uh, it's, despite all those kind of, uh, I'm going to go to the neuro neuroscience problem, but despite of those problems, uh, it's very useful to sort of uh, have a rough idea of where things are. So if you have a labeling of the structure of the, in the template space, and if you have done this morphing, uh, then you have a labeling of the structure in, your actual, in the brain you're looking at. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what basically what the, uh, the, the thing is doing. But there's a lot of, uh, uh, quirks and, uh, and difficulties with that. So one of the main questions is really is what information do you use to go from you know, your brain to the template? What is the actual thing you're trying to match? And basically what you're trying to match is a big contrast. Like if you get the border of the brain, that's, that's a big contrast. And you're going to sort of make sure that the border of the brain has about the same, the, the same, uh, uh, the same place. Um, so, uh, and, and again, you know, if things are not too viable, if you, know, you have a, a very standard, you know, amount, um, you know, number of a, of a structure, that's fine. You, you can actually sort of try to morph things and, you know, that's, that's, that sounds okay. Uh, if you have viable structures and you, 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 if you don't have a one-to-one -one mapping, that's not fine at all. We, we don't know what we're doing. And that's what the, um, the, the one of the problem is. So, uh, uh, let me just mention this because I think for a neuroinformatics sort of a, um, a community that's an, an interesting study. So the, how do you validate that you know you're uh, doing the right thing by you know by this morphing? How what's the best algorithm to do this morphing towards a template? And there's a beautiful study by Arno Klein that uh, has a look at that. He uh, you know he had a set of manually labeled brain, and then he looked at you know how much those labels after morphing were matching the template labels or those kind of ideas. And it's, it's, you've got many, many algorithms to sort of, and development to sort of people trying to you know, do the best morphing aspect. And you've got very, very few validation studies on what are, are we doing the right thing with those morphing. And that's, that's the, one of the things that I, I would like to emphasize. Those validation studies, they are the key aspect uh, in, for that, that problem. And there's several labeling in the community. Like uh, people have labeled, you know, the, the structure in the brain in 
different ways, and uh, there's no, and that's one of, also one of the things that uh, the um, you know uh, a new informatic community should work on is to how do we get consensus on those things. Uh, and there's a beautiful um, study by Bolland that showed that you know with looking at uh, eight different atlases, you got very you know got you have serious you know matching problems that you know if you look at the temporal gyrus. You know, in one atlas, it's not going to be the same, even if it's the same template, it's not going to be the same that in another atlas. Uh, and, and the sort of the, uh, the, 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 the overlap of those structures across atlases is a real problem. So, so we're doing very, very rough thing, uh, very, very rough, because, you know, we don't actually know whether we're doing the right morphing, and then we, we, don't, we don't actually know what is the right labeling of the template. And it's, uh, so that's, uh, that's to tell you how much, you know, rough things are. Uh, and this is the reality of uh, the variability of uh, our, you know, uh, cortex. And uh, if you look at, so th those are three cortices with like uh, the labeling of some uh, uh, sulci. It's a beautiful work by uh, Cachier and all the uh, uh, my colleague at Neurospin. Uh, and and, and it's, uh, it's it's just it's just that you, if you look at the sulco gyrus variability be across brain, you 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 have a very big problem to know how you're going to match to those two things. It's how do you match two, two subjects that don't have the same sulci and the same gyri? I mean, let's say you have a, there's a very famous, uh, like a, the, uh, in the singulate area, for instance, there are some of us have two sulci and some of us have one sulci. And you can't match that. There's no one-to-one -one mapping between those two structures, right? And those, so that's the problem that the, the neuroscience, neuroscience aspect, uh, you know, apart from the sort of the, the image processing aspect, that's the neuroscience aspect of the problem. And then how do we, uh, you know, uh, bring in other information, which is not the circle gyrus information, but the, maybe the cytoarchitectonic information. And there's a lot of uh, uh, excellent work by the Ziles lab look, looking at, you know, post-mortem brain and seeing what's, what's the cytoarchitectony of the, of the brain and how do we uh, map that. And, uh, and, and, you know, and there's a lot of uh, good work and interesting work. And so can we have a better mapping of those cytoarchitectonic map if we have a, a registration which is going to be on the surface of the cortex using the information of the big subgai and these sort of things. That's a good study with, uh, by Fischer uh, a few years ago uh, that uh, if you're interested in that problem. And basically Fischer showed that you know, look, looking at doing this uh, spatial normalization using the, the deep subgai is actually giving you a smaller variability of the cytoarchitectonic information, for instance. Right, uh, but still, you know, you know this is what the tool that we are using uh, for us, and that's uh, you know, how much thing, how things improve with the uh, processing. That's uh, John Ashburner sort of a work on the on templates, and this is like the, the average of 452, you know, anatomy of, of uh, subject anatomy, and you see that the, there's very little, you know, sort of a gyrus and sulci information in this average because. Uh, I mean, there's some information. There's, you know, like a, there's a, a smooth information. And that's more like we're using a, a better algorithm to, to match things, uh, you know, given the fact that we have, with the validation of Arno Klein kind of, a, you know, uh, constraint somehow, uh, and you see that the, uh, the, the, the circus and the, uh, and the anatomical information is, is getting better and better uh, with, with those things. So conclusion for the how do we average brain? Basically, we don't know how to average brain. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing would be like you have a neuroanatomist that is looking at you know, what specific uh, area can I average this area with this area of this subject and this subject. Well, that's, that's just practically impossible to do with, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in most of the cases. Uh, so, be, so what are the reliable information that we find across subjects that we want to match? That's one of the big neuroscience questions and neuroscience neuroinformatic questions. Um, uh, how do we validate? And so, um, uh, uh, what, uh, how do we uh, use sort of uh, include probabilistic information? I mean, there's, I've, I've talked about structure and things that we know there are there, but uh, you know, what's the, what about the probabilistic information uh, that we, we can get? Uh, how do we update templates? What to update atlases? Those things are like a, a, you know, there's no versioning, good versioning system, and or you like a, uh, so there's all those those things, and uh, you know, how do we deal with both landmarks and, and maps? We we know that there are you know sort of a maps of a, like a you know, continuous information. How do we? Uh, I'm not talking about probabilistic, but also just continuous information. How do we map those things? Uh, 
Uh, despite this, there's a, I mean, I'll tell you later on if I have time the, uh, the jungle story because it's a beautiful study. Uh, but there are many bad examples. I'll tell you a bad example because it's always more fun. <laughs> uh, one of the first studies uh, in, uh, in brain imaging was a study of, uh, in, with PET. And they were looking at the uh, uh, fear, uh, fear like anxiety. Uh, they were studying anxiety. They wanted to know what are the brain structure involved in, in, like, in processing on, uh, you know, anxiety. Uh, and they, uh, they had those, those subjects in the, in the scanner and so on, and they had uh, like, um, something of, uh, some, some stimulus that were generating anxiety, right? Uh, and they wanted to compare with a stimulus that was not generating anxiety, and that's, uh, that was a study. And uh, it was a nature paper, or science, maybe, I can't remember, but it was nature or science. So one of the best paper, and they looked at you know beautiful brain, map of the brain, like a, like a red, you know, like colored you know, area, and so on. And then, you know, they looked at a bit more carefully. I mean, uh, you, you always want to publish quickly in Science or Nature. Um, uh, they were a bit more carefully. And what happened is that the, uh, the subjects were clenching their teeth when they were, they were anxious. And then the, the muscles had a lot of, uh, you know, blood flow going in. And because the spatial normalization to the template was bad, they, they thought that the, the, the activity that was in the uh, temporal lobe was actually, was actually in the muscle of the, uh, of the, of the subject, right? So that's a, you know, it, it's a, Long, it's, um, you know, it's a study that you know, I think it's um, 92, three, I, don't know, I mean, one of the first studies. So it's, uh, you know, we, we've, we've passed that, uh, the community. But you know, errors happen a lot. Um, yeah. And that's a, a, special, a famous special normalization error. Diffusion imaging. I'm going way too slowly. I'm sorry, but that. <laughs> that's uh, OK. Well, well, yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, diffusion imaging, that's also fantastic. Uh, thing from uh, MRI, because that's the only in vivo modality that can, that can you know, map uh, how your brain regions are actually connected. I mean, there's no, and even if you post-mortem, if you open a brain, if you look and you know, how do I map, how do I know which area is connected to which area? It's just, you know, even with the best, you know, a neurosurgeon, you know, trying to do that, it's extremely difficult because it's a 3D object that you can't actually, you know, uh, investigate easily. So the efficient imaging is the uh, MRI modality that allows you to look at how much the water is diffusion in one direction, and when you've got a fiber track, you know, connecting, you know, two brain regions, you've got a little bit of more diffusion in the in the direction of the fiber track than across the fiber track, right? And that's the principle of it. And I'm going not to go into that. I also, should mention that diffusion imaging is is used massively for uh, stroke, uh, so it's a very good modality to look at, you know. Uh, you know, uh, if you have the stroke, uh, you know, how, how big is the impact and, you know, it has some uh, uh, effect on, you know, how you can uh, uh, treat the patient. I'm not showing you the way this is measured with MRI. I'm sure you, you can find that on the web. But basically, you measure the diffusion, uh, you know, with, in, in several directions. So in this instance, we measure the diffusion of water in uh, uh, six directions. So this is in the X direction. And you see here, for instance, the corpus callosus. Uh, is which is link, a, a big set of fiber tracks linking the two hemispheres of the brain uh, is actually having a high value because there's a lot of diffusion, uh, you know, going into into the x direction between the two hemispheres, and that's uh, that's one, you know, just to show you how it works. And then, you know, if you measure that in many directions, you can try to reconstruct, you know, how you know the the, the brain regions are connected, and that's uh, that's uh, how the, what this is illustrating. There's a lot of uh, problems. Um, which, uh, you know, you always, you know, always be skeptical, skeptical as scientists. You know, if you look at uh, something, you know, that's uh, uh, there's the problem of uh, uh, crossing. So the fiber tracks are going this way. You know, the information that you get, if you do not just measure in one, you know, in, in too few directions, you get something which is not showing you the, the crossing. So you don't, you don't actually. There's the kissing problem. I'm not saying that kissing is a problem in general. I'm just I'm thinking that you know, it's uh, uh, when two fiber tracks are going like that and then like that. So it's uh, how do you have the do you have the resolution to go uh, into that and, and and so on. So solution is to both increase the resolution, spatial resolution, both in space, having uh, you know smaller voxels, but also in the angular direction, uh, you know, measuring more uh, directions and better tracking algorithms. Uh, yeah, so that's, for instance, the, like, the kind of a, you know, diffusion sort of a uh, probability, what's the probability of the diffusion, you know, uh, in space. So each voxel 
that's an interesting uh, sort of modality. Each voxel is actually can be a little 3D image itself, where you, for each voxel you have the direction of how much diffusion you have in, in each. Uh, okay. And then you have the problem that you have also with T1. How do you uh, average those things? How do you, um, you know, construct something which is like, for, for an average population? And that's the same sort of problem. You've got you know, like a, so the big tracks you can probably sort of map and average uh, easily. The, the kind of the smaller tracks where you know, you've got high individual variability, we don't know what to do with that. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, people interested in uh, graph theory. And then you know, so let's say you have a, a you know an, an idea of how you know, which region is connected to which region. You can look at you know uh, like a, a parcellation of the brain, and then you know uh, see how much of this you know a track is going from one parcel to another parcel. What's the what's the uh, uh, the connection? And then have a kind of a connectivity matrix uh, that you can threshold, and then look at the graph that this con that this uh, this is uh, uh, producing, and then. And then you have many people actually interested in whether this graph is, has uh, you know, properties that are interesting for the brain uh, activity, whether they are like a, is, is it a modular thing, is it a small world graph, uh, what's the uh, efficiency of the graph, and, and, and all those things. And those things are, you know, can be different between populations of patient versus normal, or you know, depending on, you know. Uh, and it's also used in, uh, you know, uh, natural neurology, um, you know, yeah, but um, all right, so let's, let me talk a bit of a, a functional MRI. Uh, so, uh, so functional MRI is, you know, so I, I told you, how, you know, that uh, uh, you know, we're basically going to look at the uh, activity of the brain, but at the physiological level of, uh, of the blood response, because, of, you know, uh, this is what we can measure. And uh, so what, what is the research in, uh, in functional MRI? So first of all, people are interested in mapping uh, what uh, brain regions are doing what cognitive uh, you know, uh, uh, function. Um, also, the functional connection, do I have, even if I have a track, is it used during a specific task? Uh, you know, let's say I have a track between two brain regions, but how much information is going from one brain region to the other? Uh, and there's a lot of uh, neurological or psychiatric sort of uh, uh, possibilities of uh, you know, whether uh, uh, you know, for studying, understanding the mechanism of some of the disease, possibly following up some uh, uh, treatment, and, and so on. Uh, the only real clinical application that is at, at the moment uh, used for fMRI is the probably the um, uh, replacement for the WADA test that is, you know, telling you whether your language is mostly on the left hemisphere or versus, uh, uh, you know, on both hemisphere or, or, or on the right hemisphere. There's a as you see, there's a lot of functional variability be between subjects. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> just knowing that your language can be mostly on the, the I mean, uh, my, my language is mostly on my left hemisphere, but it's, it may not be the case for all of us here. So it's a, it's a big functional variation, right? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, let me just backtrack a little bit because that's, a, that's an interesting sort of a, you know, when you, you, you see probably in the magazines and the uh, newspaper like, a, oh, this is where the uh, processing of uh, uh, mathematics happens in the brain and we, we find out, you know, where, you know, like uh, where, you know, the, what is the region, where is the region when you think of your grandmother, uh, you know, and, and so on. And, and you know, you remember, maybe some of you, if you studied a bit of a history of science, you, you remember the, uh, the phrenology, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, and the, phren the phrenology where people are looking at, you know, your, your brain uh, sort of a shape, and they, when they, ha they had a, like a, uh, you know, a, a hole or a little bit of like a variation in the, in the shape of the brain, uh, they would tell you, oh, you have a very strong moral uh, you know, instinct, or you have, you know, you're, you're very lazy here, or, you know, or you, you're, you must be very good at mathematics, or, you know, like, uh, you know, by looking at the, you know, the, the, just the shape of the brain, of the, of the skull, right, and um, not of the brain, the skull. And, and, the, and the critic of uh, fMRI is often that uh, we are doing about the same thing. You know, we, <laughs> we just have a better tool, <laughs> but uh, we're not understanding how things are functioning by just telling you where they are. And there's a very famous analogy with, uh, by uh, uh, Jerry Fodor, who is uh, uh, who's basically saying, if you look at uh, the motor of a, of a, of a car, uh, you know, knowing where the carburetor is 
doesn't tell you anything of what the carburetor is doing uh, in the motor of the car. And that's, that's the, you know, the, the criticism and the very fair criticism that the, uh, you know, this community uh, uh, is facing. And they have received good response to that criticism, which I'm not going to, you know, to talk about. But, uh, um, I, have, I have a question to this figure. I, I remember that from last year. So, so why is, is this guy exactly put into the oven? I mean, what's the relation to phrenology? <laughs> um, I guess, I guess it's the, this is a, like a, a, an MRI kind of machine <laughs> of, of the time. <laughs> and uh, so this, is, this is what, uh, they, you know, this is the machine that would, you know, look at all your faults and, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really... <laughs> alleviate your fears of going to the doctor. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I was going to tell you a bit more like the history of well, how, you know, the uh, bold effect was, uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, discovered. And it's an interesting story because uh, it's basically a failed experiment that uh, showed the, the, the bold effect. It was basically a rat in a scanner who died, <laughs> which, which died, sorry. <laughs> it's a, and, and they realized that the, uh, the, the images after, he, he, uh, after the, the rat died was, were different in a, in a, of, a, of a contrast than before. And they realized that it was the blood flow that was the... Uh, the, the uh, and that's, that's how fMRI actually uh, was born again. And, it was, and the first kind of a study was like more in, uh, in 1992. So it's a 20 years old uh, technique. Uh, one of the things which is a very sort of a, a, a difficult and a, an interesting uh, uh, thing that have, has been done is to link, link the uh, electrophysiology and, and the bolt signal. So, the, so again, the bolt signal is basically mostly the uh, oxygenation signal, but it's got some, brand, it's got some blood volume, uh, blood oxygenation, uh, you know, sort of a mixture of, of those things. So it's a, it's a bit of a complex physiological sort of a signal to, to interpret. Uh, but so, so to, to understand a bit more what, what was happening, uh, Logotetis and the team actually went to you know, went, put a monkey, open the brain, put an electrode, put that all, all this whole thing in the you know, in an MRI machine, and, and then measured both uh, the bolt signal and the electrophysiology at the same time, which is uh, a, a very difficult uh, experiment. Um, and you see that the, the uh, local feed potential uh, sort of me uh, electrophysiological uh, measure. Like a kind of a, like a, at this time, and this is during the stimulus, and this is the kind of signal that you get with bold, which is a much more sluggish, delayed uh, uh, information. Uh, so it's not at the, the neuronal level. It's it's more like the you know the you know when when a, a set of neurons actually needs you know energy, they require uh, oxygen and glucose basically, and that's where the blood flow is coming in, and that's the, the this this overflow of oxygenated blood flow that we we are seeing in a, in a, with bold. Yeah, sure. So I've been asking about this bold signal two times already in the previous courses, and I've been wondering the source of it. And now I've done my homework and I know where it comes from. Excellent, you so, can explain. <laughs> so I will explain it now. And I think it's if you really dig into the references, you will find it. So it will actually show the activity of astrocytes together with the vessels. And this explains why it has such a slow time scale. And this would be really important to emphasize for students here yeah. because I see many projects going on in the world where they model based on this bold signal and they try to fit the neural network activity yeah. To this signal, it's it's like it's, bullshit. To it's, me. It's, a, to it's a it's a it's I'm, I'm a, a stupid thing. I, I'm, to a, do. I'm a skipping over that because it's a, yes. it's a it's a whole field in itself yes. to understand where the bolt signal and what is the bolt signal exactly. It's got, it's got several things. So the the neuronal uh, sort of origin is is actually a truly a mixture of uh, like. A, Neurons asking the astrocyte to supply. Uh, you know, so basically, neurons talking to the astrocyte, the astrocyte talking to the uh, ven uh, the uh, arterioles, uh, and and you know, and the and then all the hemodynamic aspect. The only thing I think we you should sort of be very clear: it is not a neuronal sort of electrical physiological. Like a, it's a very sluggish, you know, blood flow uh, aspect. Right. So that, that's the, uh, the the thing I wanted to. And. Um, and we have very bad models for that. Uh, so this is, this is the actual recording on, in this uh, region for visual stimulation. And this is, the, I've put the, I mean, this is the, the model that is usually used to model that thing. Uh, you know, so so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a complex thing to model. Uh, and there's a, a lot of work on, on, on that. Um, and basically, people are modeling it. Uh, if you have several uh, 
uh, things coming, uh, you know, uh, stimuli, uh, you know, for the for the subjects. Uh, then, you know, the whether the question is whether those is, is this signal actually uh, linear? Is it? Is it? Can you just you know uh, use a linear uh, model for? Uh, is it additive? Uh, and uh, and basically, it's probably not in all ranges. It's certainly not in all you know uh, situations. But in many situations, it's a rough, goodish approximation, uh, and that's uh, that's what the uh, this study has shown. That you know, if you if you to take three stimulus versus two stimulus versus one stimulus, and you can you can see that there's kind of an additive effect of the bolt signal uh, in these specific circumstances. So what? Uh, how do you process that? So it's a, so the the, the, the fMRI uh, acquisition is just like a, you know a brain volume every two or three seconds. Uh, the brain the, the the volume is acquired quite quickly for an MRI machine, so it's it has a very kind of a two or three of you know. It's a three millimeter cube resolution, so it's a three, you know, it's a it's big, it's a number, it's a great number of neurons in one one voxel, at, uh, you know, uh, and again, uh, um, so you have to sort of uh, do all the, you know, the subject is moving during the scanner, so you have to correct for the movement that you, you know, these things that you're acquiring, and then you know you're acquiring slice by slice, so you're not acquiring everything at one time, so you have to sort of correct for that you know, slice you know, thing, and then you have to sort of co-register your uh, functional signal to your anatomical signal, uh, and, and then you have to find out, or you know, uh, depending which order you do things, you have to find out which regions are actually involved in the stimulus uh, that you've uh, presented to the subject during the acquisition. Uh, so that's, uh, and as, uh, as I said, there's a lot of uh, uh, artifacts. The subject is moving, and we can't correct properly for that. We can't even estimate properly the movement because it's a slide by slide, you know, acquisition, and and we and the subject is not moving like after one. <laughs> brain has been acquired, it's moving all over, all over the place. <laughs> uh, so that's an you know, uh, example of movement artifacts uh, that are, you know. Uh, and then there's all the modeling aspect, um, which is, uh, you know, how do you, uh, so we know exactly when uh, we've, uh, you know, let's say we have a stimulus that is occurring at that time uh, in the scanner, and we've got a second stimulus occurring at that time, and we, we want to know what's the difference of the bold response between those two stimulus and some two stimuli. Um, but, but then we, you have to construct a model of what, what is uh, happening and then do the difference and so on. And this is generous, I mean, in general, this is done with uh, uh, general linear models. Uh, so it's just you know, linear regression. We're just assuming linearity and, uh, and, and go along with that. And, that, and then, because you're doing that, it voxel by voxel, you're doing that for, let's say, 30,000 voxel, 50,000 voxel, depending on the resolution. Uh, and then you've got a massive statistical problem of uh, how do you correct for the fact that you've, got, you've done so many tests for so many. So there's a classic, uh, and my background is a bit more in statistics, so there's, a, there's a multiple comparison problem uh, that you have to deal with. So how do you correct for the fact that you're testing uh, 50,000 uh, voxels? Um, so you have to increase the uh, the, the, the risk, uh, the type one error uh, um, level. And this uh, this is a uh, this is one of the classic experiments where you look at the uh, uh, the visual field and you know the eccentricity and the uh, uh, and, and the uh, rotating uh, stimuli and you can reconstruct the the, func the functional uh, areas v1, v2 and using using those stimuli uh, you know and and uh, you know. Uh, Clever, you know, modeling of that. Uh, that's a, it's a, it's a beautiful. Um, uh, and then, as I said, you've got several subjects doing roughly the same thing in the in the scanner. I mean, and despite all the, what I've told you about the the anatomical differences, roughly there will be like a, you know, uh, some regions that are going to be relatively similar across subjects. Uh, and then you have to sort of average that across, or you know, uh, you know, combine that across subjects. And there's a lot of statistical models to do that as well, mixed effect model and so on. And the uh, and, and and more interesting, I think, is you know, can we have like a a model that can uh, actually be uh, instantiated slightly differently across subjects? So you can sort of uh, so how do you build how do you build an average with things that are not exactly at the same place? And uh, you know, and that's a, that's a, there's a lot of a, a good work done by my colleague Bertrand Thirion uh, on on these sort of issues. 
is again excuse often by clinic uh, in, in clinical application. As this, this is an example where you have a, uh, a population of, of, uh, of patients that, uh, and then a population of control, and you've got two conditions for each population. You've got let's uh, let's say a, a, you know a control condition and a, and a placebo condition and a, 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 non, a drug condition, and then you know the you know the pharmas are very interested to know whether. Uh, the, the drug may have an effect, a differential effect on the normal on the control population versus on the patient population, and you know, and, and they they sometimes do fMRI studies to 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 see that. Um, and this is an, an example. So uh, where am I? Okay, so I've got uh, uh, 15 minutes left. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, tell you very very quickly on. on of fMRI connectivity, and uh, now that you have a little, maybe, maybe a little bit better idea of what uh, what, what we are talking about, it's going to uh, uh, to be you know uh, uh, reasonable. Um, so the the question, I mean, most of the early work in fMRI was done on uh, localization of, of things, and uh, with the, the caveat of the uh, neophrenology that I, I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> there is also the aspect of functional integration. Uh, uh, how do uh, regions talk to each other? On, uh, you know, with a quote. Um, and it's not. Uh, it is not uh, like a you know. A, uh, a recent question, like uh, in, the, in the in the you know in the 18th 19th century, that you, you had scientists uh, working on uh, animal uh, models, uh, you know, uh, basically lesioning some uh, part of the brain of the animals, and, and and some of them were thinking, oh, when when I lesion that, uh, you know, the animal can't do this, uh, can't, cannot function in that uh, area anymore, and some of them were saying, oh, you know, I can remove a you know, big part of the brain, and I can't I can't see any behavioral effect. Uh, you know, so and 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 the the model behind that was that whether you, we've got specialized region doing something very specific in the brain, or you or or not, and you have more like an integrative. You need a number of regions to work on something. To uh, and the answer obviously is that you have both uh, some specialization and some you know uh, 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 integration. Um, but uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 you know, uh, work now, uh, and most of the work that was done to try to find this, the localization aspect has now moved to another uh, area, which is more how do we, uh, you know, estimate the networks uh, in the brain, and you know what the, and that's uh, it has moved a lot with the uh, an idea which was very simple it was a, a Brad Bisval idea that you know if you look at you know if you put a subject without any stimuli stimulus in the in the scanner. And you look at you know how your functional signal in one part of the brain is going to be correlated to another functional signal in another part of the brain. And if this correlation is very high, then you think that you know if this, the, there's no stimulus specifically, so it's just like the the ongoing thought process of the of, of a subject. And and you know and and by default those areas are kind of you know uh, connected and therefore they share some information. That's the basic of a. Of, a, of functional connectivity. And there's a huge amount of various uh, mathematical uh, uh, and applied mathematics uh, uh, you know, uh, techniques to extract uh, those, uh, those networks or those, those uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, from like a, you know, model free to like with a much more, uh, uh, you know, with many more, like a, more like a model, a modeling aspect to it. Uh, so if you like, you, you probably all heard about uh, principal component analysis. You could look at those resting states uh, set of, uh, of uh, TRs and, uh, and see whether what are the, the main source of variation, spatially and temporally. That's one way of doing it. It's not the best way, but it's, uh, you know, it's so, so all those techniques have been tried, will be tried, uh, you know, on the, to extract you know, the relevant networks that are actually uh, sharing some information um, between regions. So let me uh, just quickly go into, uh, uh, you know, a big distinction in, the, in, in this area. So you've got the structural connectivity, which is really like a, how things are wired uh, using possibly diffusion imaging. Uh, you've got the functional connectivity, which is basically, uh, if, you, if, you, if you see functional connectivity, just replace that by correlation. I mean, that's a, that's a good first approximation. You know, you just basically, it's a, it's a more fancy word to say correlation somehow. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, um, 
so how much you know those time series are actually uh, you know uh, correlated basically? Uh, and effective connectivity is a different thing. We are trying. I mean, those techniques are trying to actually have some uh, uh, causal uh, uh, in, uh, inference, and that's a, a much more difficult thing, than, and, and possibly not uh, feasible entirely with uh, fMRI. Uh, so it's based on the model. So to just to re-establish functional versus effective connectivity, you may have a brain region talking to another brain region, which has a, a correlation between those two things. And A is also correlated with uh, C and, uh, and is talking directly. But there's no direct connection between B and C. However, uh, if you look at the correlation, you will see a correlation because of this. Uh, you know, and that's the, what the, uh, you know, uh, uh, some uh, researchers are trying to decipher. They're trying to sort of what is the actual, you know, uh, effective connectivity and not the, uh, connect the correlation somehow. Uh, so I've got a bunch of things that I wanted to quickly say on functional connectivity. Um, in, the, in the previous slide here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. In the previous slide, uh, how did you get the values of the effective connectivity or? Oh, this is this is yeah. simulation to show you. Uh, th there are ways of doing that. Like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, partial correlation is is one. I mean, the, uh, the uh, you know, like if, if you uh, study the precision metrics of a of a uh, you know uh, multivariate normal, the zeros on the precision metrics are you know linked to the conditional independence of those regions. So you can you know sort of a, there are ways of of doing that. But uh, it's um, um, but that was simulation. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so quickly, what, what is, you know, uh, um, there's a lot of work, uh, I mean, this is not limited, to, I mean, this, this kind of study is not limited to fMRI, people are doing that with EEG, MEG as well. Uh, there's a, um, you know, popular uh, sort of a techniques, the most popular techniques probably for extracting those networks is the ICS, you may have heard about that, independent component analysis. Um, Correlation in time series can be spurious. I mean, they, they, there's a big problem and a lot of uh, you know, uh, literature on the problem of the movement. Obviously, if you move, uh, you're going to correlate things you know, uh, you, with, you know, be, between regions across time, or you could possibly going to decorrelate things. I mean, uh, and that's a, that's a big uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of a methodological hurdle. Um, there's, uh, there's sort of an uh, interaction between you know, people looking at how much, what's, what's, the, okay, what's the correlation during that kind of task versus what's the correlation during that kind of task. So how, how, how do I change the correlation, the, co the, the connectivity? I say correlation now because that's a more fair word. Uh, but you know, uh, between, between tasks, that's, uh, that's another thing. It's called, uh, it has the fancy name of a uh, psychophysiological interaction. So, um, and yeah, there's a reason for that. There's the, the, the most classic thing is the seed-based analysis. You pick up a brain region, you look at the correlation, and you make a map of the correlation with the other brain regions. That's a, what is called the seed-based uh, analysis. Uh, so I'm, I'm going a little bit uh, quickly. Independent analysis, I just wanted to show you the sort of the, the that is also actually very close to uh, the, the linear model that we usually perform on that. Uh, so you have your data, and again, <coughs> You know, look, remember the MEG data, you have the, uh, uh, the space here and the time here. So this is the big matrix of your data. Uh, and then uh, what you're trying to do is decompose that into uh, you know, some, uh, uh, some uh, temporal aspect and some uh, 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 spatial aspect. So you're trying to decompose that matrix uh, using the independence uh, uh, constraint uh, for that. But there's plenty of you know, matrix decomposition techniques and you could uh, use on uh, others. I mean, uh, PCA is one of them. And uh, for instance, this is an example of a, um, a nice CA done on a, a task-based uh, uh, fMRI, where you, you can see that two of the components that have been extracted uh, temporarily uh, show the, uh, the effect of the, uh, of the, the task. Uh, and, they, and especially, of course, as well, this was a visual task, and you found this uh, component in the visual areas. Uh, but you find other components that are you know, less clear that you wouldn't have found using a specific model uh, because you wouldn't know about it uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the in the area in the, in the brain. So you you know those those kind of uh, other components that are unexpected uh, can uh, shed some light on the on the uh, on the processing. I'm going to skip that. Um, just a warning. 
slide maybe on causality. Uh, it's extremely hard. I mean, causality, uh, have, uh, you know, have to look at, look at what is causality and the definition of causality. But uh, basically, it, it may be uh, because of, uh, you, can, you can believe on, uh, on causality because of uh, temporal information. You can believe of it because you've got uh, an a priori of, uh, on it. You can, you know, believe in it because it's, uh, there's a direct manipulation. If I do this to that node, that is going to happen to the uh, so um, and you know direct intervention somehow. But in general, uh, FM, it's very hard to find any actual causal thing with just fMRI. Uh, and because of the timing is so uh, uh, you know sluggish because of the uh, uh, of all the uh, you know uh, artifacts possible artifacts and so on. So just maybe a, a warning slide. But you know, some people are trying that. So one of the aspects of causality would be like if something happens before something else, uh, it must be uh, sort of a, at least. Uh, I mean, it, it could be causal uh, somehow. So uh, so people are actually trying to see what's the somehow the correlation by you know shifting uh, the, the time series and see is there a correlation by with between shifted time series? Uh, that's basically Granger causality uh, thing. Um, and you see, I mean, there are studies showing that uh, you know some. Uh, uh, areas are actually having their activity, again, the bold activity, which may not be the neural activity, but the bold activity uh, before some other areas, and, and therefore trying to find some, uh, you know, a better model of the, of the processing that is happening uh, in the brain. I'm going to skip that. It's a very interesting technique, uh, maybe misused, but, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, um, I'm going to uh, not do that, but that's an attempt to have an actual model that you, uh, you you put the graph, you, you say, okay, I know that this uh, region is connected to this region, I know that this one is connected to this one, and so on, and then I will estimate what is the, uh, you know, the uh, transfer of information, what is the impact of the, uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I guess uh, in the five last minutes, so there's, there's a, a, a from those, uh, connectivity uh, studies and those uh, 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 correlation sort of uh, uh, um, matrices. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are actually uh, going from that to uh, a graph uh, theory uh, study. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, graph, I mean, a lot of interest in graph theory studies. Um, and the, uh, and the, you know, there's a lot of questions. So basically the, the idea is that you, you take your uh, brain, you cut it into, you parcelate it into, let's say, 200 regions or 1,000 regions or 50 regions or whatever, and then you look at the uh, correlation or maybe partial correlation, you know, uh, of those uh, this metrics, and then you threshold that and you you think, okay, this is the graph of the connection, you know, for that population, for that that condition, for and so on. And, uh, and, and then I'm going to study some characteristic of this graph, and, that's a, it, and there's a lot of uh, stud, you know, uh, people interested in these uh, this things. And there's a lot of uh, modern graph estimation. Uh, I was you know, uh, talking about the partial correlation, so, which is you know, uh, related to the inverse covariance conditional independence thing. Um, and a lot of techniques uh, for trying to regularize the estimation because you know you got a lot of regions. If you do that voxel by voxel, you uh, you know you don't have enough information for for doing this sort of thing. So the, there's a lot of good, uh, I mean, uh, interesting statistical methods, which is more my world, uh, uh, to estimate uh, those things in in the best way. It's, it's a difficult problem uh, to to estimate the uh, the underlying graph when you when you've got the correlation matrix or the uh, covariance matrix. Uh, many methods don't recover the graph. That's a good study by uh, Steve Smith uh, a few years ago. Uh, so it's uh, just uh, you know tell you that you know while there is this attempt, uh, there's a, a you know a small uh, success somehow. Uh, and the last thing I will tell you about, uh, maybe not, maybe I, I'm going to skip that section. But uh, basically, I just want to mention that uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in predicting, uh, and it's actually good in terms of science to, to think that uh, you know if you if you have a model that can predict something, then uh, it's a much more solid thing that you can work on than to have just like a, 
uh, something you know, like a, a map that you, <laughs> you look at a correlation aspect, if you want. Uh, so the prediction aspect is, is, uh, is, is really uh, critical in, uh, uh, in all science, but, but in, in our world, in, in the new imaging, brain imaging world, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which is uh, being developed uh, actively uh, for uh, now for some time. And, um, and basically, you have several questions about that. You have the question of, uh, uh, you know, if the subject, uh, uh, if I have the brain uh, fMRI data of a subject, uh, do, can I uh, infer what the subject is doing? So it's kind of a, the you know, light detector or the uh, sort of a, you know, a kind of machine that, you know, can I, can I, can I know what you're thinking when I have got your, you know, and obviously, it, this is fan fantasy, you will never know exactly what the subject is thinking over, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, but, uh, but there are some things that you can, you, you know that you, there's a pattern of activity that resembles, like for, uh, uh, that, you know, you're pretty sure that the subject is more looking at, a, you know, a, a face than a, than a car, for instance. That, that kind of thing can be, uh, can be uh, predicted somehow. So in, in control environments, in a, you know, you can, you know, infer uh, some of the, uh, some information, uh, You've, uh, with um, fMRI, and that's what, uh, so I'm skipping that. There was an er early study by uh, Jim Haxby on that, on that problem, like uh, looking how much the, um, how much the, the pattern uh, was look, you know, like uh, a pattern that is uh, like a, the, uh, the pattern that uh, is in the fusiform face area when you're looking at a, a face, for instance. And, and, and therefore, you know, being able to say, okay, the, the subject is actually now looking at the face. Uh, and there's an interesting, you know, work on, in, in this area where people would, uh, would yeah. Uh, okay. So the last thing, which I'm now over time, I guess, but, uh, um, is uh, reproducibility issues. So uh, um, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, fMRI and, and brain imaging is a, uh, is a very sort of a, uh, a popular technique. It's always very easy to put uh, a picture of the brain with uh, you know uh, uh, you know shiny uh, spots uh, you know on the uh, on the anatomy uh, in, a, in a newspaper or like a, so. It, therefore, it, it has a lot of a, like a hype somehow. It's, it's got a and uh, but the, the the reality is that uh, because of that, partly uh, the uh, a number of studies uh, are actually underpowered. So you find something by, you know, you sort of analyzing a lot of the data, and then you eventually find something. And because you're a PhD student and you have really have to publish, you're publishing something. But there's a lot of uh, um, uh, um, unreproducible or difficult to reproduce or like uh, uncertain results in the literature. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, there's a, a, a very strong feeling in uh, in many of the, uh, the you know the, uh, in many of us in the in the community that we should improve um, the uh, brain imaging reproducibility aspect uh, by uh, a number of things like uh, uh, you know uh, having bigger ends uh, you know, bigger uh, group uh, population uh, sharing the data and the code so that people can you know see what's being done and, and possibly find mistakes. It's so easy to make mistakes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex set of you know, uh, number of processings uh, that you have to, you know, deal with. And, uh, and you know, it, it's just very easy to make mistakes. Uh, so, so having, you know, uh, a better sort of uh, ethic on the, on, you know, uh, on, on the data sharing and the code sharing and, you know, and thinking, okay, this is, as a scientist, uh, I should be, you know, uh, you know uh, making sure that my results are, are valid and, uh, and are reproducible. And therefore, I mean, I, I've, and I've got an interest in uh, in, in uh, you know, having the feedback of the community on on, on those on those things. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that was that was the last thing I wanted to mention. That uh, uh, brain imaging has uh, probably, along with other uh, scientific communities, uh, to work uh, on the reproducibility aspect of of uh, some of the studies. Um, uh, and there's a, you know, it's, it's a general thing, but it's, it's uh, the specificity in brain imaging is that we've got usually a small group of subjects and therefore, uh, you know, a very underpowered study. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, computing the power of your studies is one of the critical things uh, before, before we start. And there are some uh, good initiatives, uh, like there are big uh, uh, data sets that are being acquired and shared. And, uh, and so the, the world is, uh, the, this, this world is a bit changing. And I think there's a, 
there's an emerging somehow uh, you know, tr uh, you know, uh, skill and, and there's an emerging you know, population of scientists who a little bit like in the uh, genetic community, we've got biostatisticians that are, they know the databases, they know how to you know, query those databases, they know, the, you know what's, what's uh, interesting in terms of the, all this information you know, spread across all those resources in, on the web. I think the brain imaging is actually moving towards this. We, we, we're going to get like a, you know, informaticians uh, you know, working on you know, a system to share, to you know, query databases, to, uh, you know, to have all those uh, ontology that is uh, are, you know, getting there. And, uh, and Marianne, I don't know if you've talked already about that, but you will. Uh, and so there's, there's an emerging sort of a um, you know, scientist, uh, a kind of scientist that will have a, a hybrid uh, sort of a, a, a skill, and actually both skills, of uh, knowing enough on, on the, the brain and the neuroscience aspect, and knowing and having good skills in terms of uh, uh, database processing, uh, computer science, uh, and the knowledge of you know, what, where are the resources, and how can I use that to answer uh, good questions about the, uh, uh, the brain. I think that's, a, that's an emerging uh, sort of a job somehow uh, that uh, I wish uh, some of you will uh, uh, be interested in. And I think I will finish uh, here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sure. Uh, which one? person, a different activity if he sees house or anything like there was on slide. So, yeah. Brand decoding. Uh, the, the XP one? Yeah, this one? Yeah. Yeah. So do you mean to say like if the person is seeing face or house, there is a different pattern of activity? Correct. So what if that person is recollecting those same images? Do you see any difference in the activity? Yeah. Like seeing a house and recollecting the same house? In my mental imagination, yeah, how big difference? I think, I think uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, I believe uh, like a rec uh, just recalling and just mental imaginary of uh, a specific uh, a face versus mental imagery of a house uh, will probably lead to uh, you, know, uh, you know some success in decoding. I'm not. I'm, I'm, it's not going to be 100%. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, but but they will, they, uh, I think there's uh, the yes I think uh, I think there is uh, it's probably uh, enough uh, activity in the fusiform face area compared to the parahippocampal place area for instance that uh, that you you may be able to be able to to say okay this subject has more likely thought about the house versus the face uh, that's that's uh, that's probably correct yeah. But I, mean, also I, 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 I should we should look at the literature for that. But uh, you know that's uh, that's my you know sort of take on it. But, uh, yeah. yeah, and also there could be associations. So uh, this depends on person to person, right? You cannot generalize. So for example, if I see the nest of a bird, maybe I could have the same activity because I have a very association of house and the nest of a bird. Yeah. Or it could be something like I see uh, yeah. house like. So how? You yeah, yeah. So no. Uh, again, what I was saying is that uh, in very controlled uh, sort of uh, environment where you know that the subject is either thinking of um, a place or either thinking of a face, uh, then you may have some uh, You you will have some success in uh, in you know decoding in a sort of a uh, decoding is, is a bad word, but uh, uh, predicting uh, you know uh, uh, what what the, the subject is actually thinking of. Uh, but but, but in, in general, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in general, that's that's just a task that we 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 are not able to do, and and it's going to be you know we yeah it's. Uh, but still, it's uh, very difficult to have that controlled environment, right? Because in yesterday's lecture, I think in one of the example you were showing, like a person was shown an unknown word. When you say unknown word, it could be possible that he has forgotten that word. Maybe later he realized how how you will ensure that it's unknown. So maybe I saw a face today, it's totally new face for me. But after some time when I started talking, oh, I realized, oh, we had met 20 years back, or oh, something like you recall. Uh, again, so, again, it's, it's uh, under very controlled, you know, specific uh, experimental uh, uh, design, you know, like, uh, it's, it's not, 
I'm not sure what you know, that answer. No, I understand, but, but how you ensure that it's very controlled? For example, how you ensure that that word is unknown to that person? Uh, so that's the world of an uh, experimental psychologist, uh, and they are skilled with that. And they, they, you know, they have some. They do sometimes uh, other experiments after the scanning or before the scanning to to get those controlled. It's, it's a it's a whole sort of trade to you know sort of uh, making sure that you know what uh, you you think you are studying is actually the thing you are studying. But uh, but uh, there there are um, you know the um, I mean I'm not saying in general it's uh, it's it's a it's so a, you mean like it's possible to have a controlled environment precisely or I just want to know how much percent is there any deviation? It's I, I don't think it, no, it's not possible to control what the subject is thinking. <laughs> no, <laughs> means so, to so know it's not, exactly. It's not, it's not possible yeah. to to say for sure. You know that. Uh, you know uh, what I'm saying is that uh, I think it is possible uh, to ask subject to think of either one thing or the other, and to to some degree uh, recover. Uh, you know which condi which uh, stimulus the subject was thinking of. Uh, that's all. Uh, that's the only thing I'm saying. I'm not saying, you know, like uh, in other conditions, in like uh, it's. Uh, uh, but uh, and uh, and again, I mean, uh, how much of that you can recover? Uh, we, I, we should look at the literature. Maybe uh, I mean, small of that. I mean, a small amount of that. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's. Uh, it is not a machine that uh, reads your f your thought, uh, <laughs> contrary to you know newspaper. Sort of, uh, <laughs> Uh, on the topic of reproducibility and unworthy publications, I think it's especially present in fMRI studies because it's typically very low subjects and highly dimensional problems. If you know the Ig Nobel Prize, like an anti Nobel, there was a lot of publications from fMRI studies yes, that won correct. the prize. And it's a it's it's a fact that it's due also. I mean, I mean, you um, I mean, you've you've read the uh, UNEDIS papers, but uh, uh, if you haven't, uh, do do read the uh, uh, UNEDIS 2005 and uh, you know and and why the most research uh, results are false and uh, and it's 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 a combination of things. Uh, and I have actually have a, a few slides on that. Actually, I sh maybe I should show you the. Uh, at least the, um, so yeah, that's a, and, and, and it's a combination of things. And, and one of, uh, one aspect is a sociological aspect is that, you know, many people are, in, you know, getting like a, you know, reward of publication and things. And, and, and they're trying, you know, uh, experiments without much thought or like a much uh, seriousness. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's one aspect of, of, of that is that the, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be, uh, the other aspect is like the flexibility of analysis. I mean, uh, you when you've got the pressure of the scientific uh, community to publish because you have to do that if you want to, to, to stay in academia and, and you know, uh, then you, know, you will publish something eventually by squeezing the data as much as you can. And, you know, and, 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 and paper and journals don't take very much uh, into account like non-positive non results. And you know, there's a whole bunch of, 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 uh, of reasons and rationale why uh, there's, there's a problem. And, 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 and some scientists would actually uh, partly deny that because, because it, there's a very strong feeling that what you're doing is right. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's very hard to uh, sort of uh, um, have the humility to, uh, to say, okay, you know, I, should really, I'm, I should really focus on the facts and on the, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's just uh, human nature. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's hard. Uh, and, but, but as a scientist, uh, I think that's the, you know, you have to think of, uh, of you know, okay, I, I just have, I have to be, you know, like, a, it's, and it's difficult. And so there are solutions that are emerging. Like, a, so there's a number of people say, okay, we should really share more of the data and the processing and things like that so people can check. Um, there's also the pre-registration of hypotheses. For instance, uh, if I have an hypothesis, uh, I should pre-register it. And then I acquire the data, analyze the data, and say, okay, that was wrong, or that was true. I mean, like, you know, I confirm or, or, you know, or not the, the hypothesis. And that's a better sort of a, you know, a, a path. Uh, and uh, some journals are, you know, are, are going this direction, and they say, okay, uh, you know, if your hypothesis and the, the method that you're going to investigate it, uh, in, invest, investigate it is, 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 is uh, okay, is well, is review, it, that is reviewed by some co your peers, and if they agree, that's a good hypothesis, that's a good method to investigate it, then whatever the result, we're, we're going to publish it, uh, even if it's a, a negative result. And that's so, so, that, so there are ways of... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, well, uh, some journals have a publishing, like a published checklist, like Nature, for example, so it's really controlled the statistical analysis, but it should really 
become a trend in more journals, I think, and they should also employ statisticians with them. And just a quick question I want to ask in the... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm slightly getting worried about the time. Are we okay with time? Or who's, uh, who's in charge of... Uh, who's the timekeeper? Okay, okay, so, okay, but, okay, okay well, just about the anatomical yeah. atlas, so I guess in the subcortical areas, we'll probably estimate anatomically, so edge de detection, um, image processing. What about the cortical areas? Is it more functionally determined? It depends. I mean, uh, it's, it's a good question. I mean, like, uh, there are some uh, uh, deep cirque that are actually uh, are good landmarks for uh, change in functional areas, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, always the case. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a uh, it's it's a bit of a complex uh, mixed, uh, uh, and, and it is a research question. So you know, uh, it's it's it really is a research question. Which okay, maybe I can ask you later. Yeah. Someone else yeah. can. I also say one thing about the not producing faulty results, and uh, at least from my experience, I've never done this kind of you know, things. But 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 you, if you do things without completely understanding it, what you I mean, borrowing some methods from others, some library or something you're much more likely to do mistakes. Correct. So I think this is also that this is sort of like this very advanced machine. And, and uh, a lot of the people don't, mm, haven't really looked into the basic physics of it, what do you really measure? So just do it as a black box. And I think that's also a recipe for, yeah. for making mistakes. It is true. Uh, and, and to, I mean, making mistakes or uh, making interpretation mistake, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, but a, a lot of mistakes are done during the processing. I mean. Uh, Let's assume you know roughly what you're measuring and you're not going to overinterpret the, the bold response. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, room for mistakes at the, the processing levels. And, uh, and most of the uh, psychologists or, like, uh, or even uh, MDs that are working with those tools, uh, they often lack the uh, appropriate training on, on the computer science aspect that uh, would you know, sort of limit those mistakes. So we need these people, right? We need those people, yeah, absolutely, exactly. yes. <laughs> so, so coffee, I think. Coffee, 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 okay, you're the time to go. Okay, thank you. <laughs>